Luke chapter 13, continuing through the book of Luke from this morning. We're looking tonight at straightened on the Sabbath. Straightened on the Sabbath. Luke chapter 13, we'll be looking at verses 10 through 21. We'll take the verses as they come in the outline tonight. Let's pray and ask God's help as we begin. Father, we thank you tonight for the opportunity to be together in the house of the Lord. What a privilege it is for us as believers to be together on a, a Sunday night like this in freedom. And we thank you, Lord, for the freedom we have to worship. And we ask, Lord, that you would maintain that always for us here in this country. Uh, we think of those in many lands that do not have uh, this opportunity, where they are persecuted for getting together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and here we are so, so blessed. So we pray for our brothers and sisters in foreign lands that cannot do this. Uh, we pray for their deliverance from the tyranny that they're under. And we ask that the day will come when they will be able to worship in freedom as well. We ask tonight that you would speak to our hearts as we consider uh, this uh, really neat story, uh, this really neat account of our Savior. We see his words, his teaching as he is on the march to Jerusalem to get to that cross and there to pay for our sin with his own blood. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to fill me now for the message. I trust and depend in you for that. I can't do this myself. I trust in you for it and depend, depend in you and you only. So bless us, make us a blessing. Teach us now from thy word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a church in Cambridge, England called the Round Church. It was built in 1107 as a prayer chapel for knights on their way to the Crusades. Its circular design was modeled after the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. It will seat maybe 200 people if they're in there tight. And when they come, they sit on little, tiny, low-cut pews. Why are these pews so short? In the mid-19th century, the church's vicar was a dwarf. And on one occasion, when Queen Victoria came to church to visit it, he really scared her to death when he stepped from in between two of the pews. So, all the pews in the church were cut down so that that never, ever happens again. Well, here in our text tonight in Luke 13, we're going to talk about a woman who was short. And she was short by reason of a crippling infirmity brought on by the devil himself. And Jesus heals her. It was an awesome miracle, but Jesus, he did it on the wrong day. He got in trouble for that. He did it on the wrong day. And so we're going to have a confrontation. And it is going to demonstrate for us some truth about the kingdom of God. And that brings us to our first point tonight. The kingdom of God in verses 10 and 11 of Luke chapter 13. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity, okay, brought on by the devil. Eighteen years. I want you to remember that. This has been going on for 18 years, and we're going to see some interesting things about the president of the synagogue. And was bowed together. She was bent over and could in no wise lift up herself. So that's why she was so short. The devil had inflicted her with this terrible disease and her, her backbones were getting fused together and it just kept bending her over more and more and more. And so that's where we are tonight with the kingdom of God. And so we have the short women, this woman, and she visits the synagogue and she has this terrible disease. And there's a name that the medical world has given it. It's uh, spondylitis deformans. It causes the bones in your spine to fuse into a rigid mass. And that's exactly what the Greek wording here is telling us. She was stuck in a 
posture of forced humiliation. It would be very humbling to have to go to the synagogue bent over like that, like you're half of a person, no longer to be able to stand up straight any longer, to have to kind of twist your body, to turn your head a little bit to see what exactly is going on. And so as the years have gone by, she sank lower and lower with this disease, but yet her spiritual focus was upward. She was someone who was at the synagogue to worship her Lord. She was evidently a regular attender. She would be there whenever it was open for service. It would have been easy for her to just stay home. I wonder how many people like that would just stay home because I don't want to go out in public. I don't want that. And, and I'm just going to stay home. And, uh, but no, she sought the solace of the synagogue of God. In letter A, we see the kingdom manifested, the kingdom manifested. On that Sabbath day, she's shuffling into the synagogue, and nobody notices her except one person. The Lord Jesus Christ saw her. He noticed her. Look at verses 12 and 13. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. You are loosed from your infirmity. In other words, you are permanently healed. You're never, ever going to go through this again. Satan has now been crushed by the Lord Jesus Christ in this episode. The woman saw loving resolve in her Savior's eyes. You know, only Jesus perfectly fulfilled the law. Only Jesus really loved his neighbor as himself. And he says to her, you are permanently set free from your infirmity. She stood up straight and tall, head erect and what does she do she starts praising god wouldn't you do that yeah i think i would be praising god a lot i mean i praise god for a lot of things a lot smaller than that this is huge and the people they witness this and they gasp and all of a sudden praise is filling the synagogue for the great things that jesus has just done and the immediacy of the healed woman's praise revealed her already devout heart. She was already on board spiritually. Thanksgiving erupts from her own prayerful heart. And she speaks with more than her voice. She speaks with her hands and her eyes and her body, which has now been made whole and is coming forth from her very soul. At that moment, she was the most eloquent woman in the universe. This is a divine display of kingdom power. The Lord Jesus Christ, his kingdom power was displayed by many things. Many, many miracles that he has already performed and will continue to perform. All the exorcisms that he has done. We read about the one this morning where uh, the man that was in the tombs comes out and these demons want to go into the pigs. That was a bad decision. And uh, down the hill they went and it was over. Power, power over nature. He had the power to calm a storm like that quickly. He gifted his disciples to go forth and teach and do miracles as well. This healing right now on this day was a taste of kingdom power that jesus christ worked not just then but throughout the history of the church jesus sees us in our need and even more significant our deepest inward deformities we're looking tonight at a woman who had an outward physical deformity but jesus sees our inward deformities and he wants to make us whole when Jesus says, you are set free, that means that the glazed eyes of the blind flicker open with redeeming light. Lives twisted by sin stand up straight and tall and erect. 
All the glory goes to God for that. And on that day, glory filled the temple. Glory to our great God. But then we have a party pooper in letter B. The kingdom rejected. The kingdom rejected. Sadly, not everybody accepts kingdom rule. We want to check out the synagogue president, the head of the synagogue on that day. He is upset because Jesus healed on the Sabbath. Look at verse number 14. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, there are six days. Listen, people, there are six days that you can do work. Come and be healed on one of those days, not on the Sabbath. Hmm. Where's this guy been for the last 18 years? Why hasn't he done something about this poor soul in the last 18 years? No. He doesn't like it that Jesus is doing this on the Sabbath. He's got no heart to pity this woman. I think if a, a lady walked in here tonight, came through those doors, and was bent over like that, I think everybody in here would take great pity on that person. This guy had no compassion, and there was no rejoicing coming from his lips about what Jesus did. But from the crowd, yes. On that day, they were really with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we notice that he won't even talk to Jesus himself. He talks to the crowd. He talks to the people. Evade the Lord Jesus. Talk to them. His heart was pumping formaldehyde, breathing arsenic. He was a great protector of the law. No, he was not. His lack of love for the woman showed that he did not love his neighbor as himself. But Jesus did. He did not love God either. He was proving it. He was about to be leveled by the Lord Jesus. I love it when Jesus does that. <laughs> that brings us to letter C, the kingdom defended. The kingdom defended. So Jesus and everybody he walked around with in those days had to tolerate and put up with all these rabbinical rules and regulations. I mean, they had a book full of rules and regulations. I read some of the list of these rules. They're quite ridiculous. It's, it's amazing. Who had time to sit down and write that stuff? It's terrible. So in these regulations, they had a lot of places where you had time and were allowed to take care of your livestock on the Sabbath day. We can't, Jesus, you don't heal, but we can go home and make sure the animals are fed and watered and walked around the pasture and we can take care of them, but we don't do this on the Sabbath. And so it's a terrible thing. Uh, they made it easy with their regulations to feed, to water, to walk their animals around. So what does Jesus do? He lays into this guy. He lays into the synagogue leader. It was, it was a crushing and overwhelming reply that Jesus had. Jesus castigated this leader and everybody else who thought like him. When Jesus spoke, he humiliated them and the people in the synagogue were delighted. Mm, yes, finally, they get their due. Let's look at verse number 17. Well, we've got to back up 15 and 16. The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not... We've heard that before in Luke, haven't we? The Lord has said this before. I think this is at least the third time. Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? So he's given a little rundown about some of their, their rules and regulations. And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, see that's where it came from, Lo, these 18 years be loosed from this bond on 
the Sabbath day. Why not? Why not today? It needs to be done. We see some words, some uh, phrases here in these verses. Daughter of Abraham. That's a triple argument from Jesus. Number one, she is a human being, not an ox. Two, she is a daughter of Abraham. And three, she is old and she is ill. She is in not good condition at all. And then Jesus said, ought not, meaning of necessity, Jesus has to heal her today. I'm here today. She's here today. She needs to be healed today. And then we have the, the three words, whom Satan bound. Her disease was due to that wicked, rotten devil. Now we look at verse number 17. And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed. And all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him, by the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow, the crowds are with Jesus today. They are really with him today. And the synagogue leader, he kind of slumps away. He has been humiliated. He, it means that he blushed with shame. He was put in his place. The woman, what is she doing? She's walking straight up, head erect, praising God. And what's the crowd doing? You think they're cheering a little bit? Yeah, I think so. This is a great day in the synagogue to see this woman be healed. Kingdom power was filling the air in the synagogue on that day. Point number two tonight is kingdom victory. Kingdom victory. We'll be seeing this in verses 18 through 21. With the healing of this woman, Jesus demonstrated the ongoing victory of the kingdom despite the opposition of men and the opposition of Satan himself. Now he uses the occasion to instruct the people concerning the growth of the kingdom using two parables. Let's look at verses 18 through 21. Then said he, and here we have Jesus finishing this out now, Unto what is the kingdom of God like? And whereunto shall I resemble it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and cast into his garden, and it grew, and waxed a great tree, and the fowls of the air lodged in the branches of it. And again he said, Whereunto shall I liken the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. These growth parables that we see here, as they have been called, have been uh, the subject of mis- and over-interpretation. This was especially true in the 19th century when it was commonly taught that the gospel would keep spreading until the world was Christianized and the kingdom was ushered in. We all know that is not true. For example, toward the end of that century, Sidney Gulick wrote a book entitled The Growth of the Kingdom of God. The book's argument was that Christianity is inexorably spreading and will ultimately take over the whole world. So why not convert to Christ right now? Gulick reasoned as James Montgomery Boyce summarizes for us. The Christian powers have increased the territory under their rule from about 7% of the surface of the world in 1600 to 82% in 1893. While the non-Christian powers have receded from about 93% to about 18% during the same period. At present, the Protestant nations alone rule about twice as much territory as all the non-Christian nations combined. 
He added, during the first 90 years of the religious history of the United States, more people have come under the direct influence of the Christian church than during the first thousand years of Christianity in all lands combined. Christianity is going to take over, so you better get on the bandwagon. Those who imagine the kingdom can be brought in by the preaching of the gospel, neglecting the teaching of the mystery parables of Matthew 13, such as the sower. What happens in the parable of the sower? Do the majority of the people in the parable of the sower receive Christ? No. Number four, one no, two no, three no, four yes. It is not a domination. And also the parable of the weeds in verses 24 to 30, which demonstrate that the church and its rule will neither be universal nor perfect. We know that is, that is the truth. It is not perfect. What really put an end to such an unbiblical, though noble, dreams were the great wars and sins of the so-called Christian nations. 1945, Helmut Theolik, the eminent theologian and preacher of the University of Hamburg, stood before his congregation in the choir loft of his church, which had been reduced to ruins by the air raids, and he spoke these words. We must not think of it as a gradual Christianization of the world, which will increasingly eliminate evil. Such dreams and delusions which may have been plausible enough in more peaceful times, have vanished in the terrors of our man-made misery. The 19th century, which brought forth a number of these dreams and dreamers, strikes us today as being an age of unsuspecting children. Who can utter the word progress today without getting a flat taste in his mouth? Who can still believe today that we are developing toward a state in which the kingdom of God reigns in the world of nations, in culture, and in the life of the individual? The earth has been plowed too deep by the curse of war. The streams of blood and tears have swollen all too terribly. Injustice and bestiality have all been too cruel and obvious for us to consider such dreams to be anything but bubbles and froth. And that is the truth. The biblical realism in these two parables does not teach triumphalism. The view that one religion will dominate all others. And that's what they were thinking when everything was going really nice. It's funny how we get interesting ideas when things are going smoothly. And all of a sudden that big balloon gets popped. And we start thinking in a different direction. No. So the biblical realism of these two parables does not teach triumphalism, but rather the effective growth of the church and the authentic, transforming power of Christ's gospel. It does transform people's lives. That brings us to subpoint A seed power. Seed power. We have that in verse number 19. It is like a grain of mustard seed which a man took and cast into the garden. It grew and waxed into a great tree, and the fowls of the air lodged in the branches of it. The tiny mustard seed, a seed that is so small, it's hard for the human eye to even see it. But yet that little tiny seed is able, it produces a huge tree. You would never think it. How could this little tiny seed do that? Produce a gigantic tree capable of housing who knows how many birds. Likewise, the kingdom, the kingdom of God, which began so small, so insignificantly, has grown immensely so that it has a huge effect on the world. And it will continue to do so until Jesus comes. We sit here in the United States of America still in relative freedom and ease 
and able to just come to church when you want, worship the Lord, go home, no fear. And at the same time, there are people in other lands who are worshiping, and they know they may get thrown into jail, and they are strong, and they continue to worship. Places like China and other places in that region are not friendly to the gospel at all. But you know, even in China, Christ is having an effect. People are being saved. And the government doesn't like that. And they don't like Christ. And they don't like Christians. And they will do. And, and they don't like Christians. And they don't like other religions either. And so they will persecute. But the kingdom is going to reach all nations. It is going to do that. And then be yeast power. Yeast power in verse number 21. It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Yeast or leaven works silently and unseen. Leaven is sneaky. <laughs> you put it in there. And next thing you know, you get up the next morning and that thing has grown. It is just beautiful how that happens. And you put it into the oven and bake it and partake of it. Yeast or leaven, it works silently and unseen from the inside, but it affects everything. The gospel affects everything in this world. It wields incredible transforming power. We see from these parables that the kingdom of God will go out and it will reach all nations. And its effects are going to be vast and have been vast and profound. Here we have a crippled woman stretching to her full height, standing tall, giving praise to God. That is what the kingdom does. It works individually. The kingdom works a life here and a life there and a life over there. And another life over here is transformed all across America and all around the world. A life here and a life there. This is the power of the kingdom of God. Jesus sees us as we really are. He sees the blindness. He sees the twistedness. But you know what? As Jesus looks as, at us, the sinners, what does he say to us? He says the same thing to us that he said to that woman. What did he say to her? Your disease is done. It is over. You are totally and permanently cured. When you came to Christ, whenever that was, and you received Jesus Christ as your Savior, that in essence is what Jesus did for you. He fixed you up real good. By faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary and his resurrection from the tomb. You are set free. And isn't it wonderful that every day that we live, people are being set free from their sin. They're being set free from the destiny of hell and ultimately the lake of fire. The Lord Jesus, his hands are outstretched to everyone all around the world, today and every day. What a blessed thought that is. Let us pray. Father, we thank you tonight for another great episode in the life of our Savior. His teaching, his preaching, his observations, his miracles, his instruction, his handling of crowds and leaders. It just amazes us how he does it how he did it, how he still does it to this day. We thank you, Lord, for this, this excellent example of this wonderful miracle. A woman who has been gradually bending over and being bent over for 18 years. And then at last, the touch of the master's hand. And he touches her and he heals her. And she stands tall as ever, head erect, and gives praise to our God. Let us also be people of great praise for all that you do in all of our hearts and our lives as well. 
Take us, Lord, make us a blessing. Help us to just revel in the wonderful thoughts and miracles of our wonderful Savior. May we rejoice in all that you have done, what you're doing right now in our lives, and what you will do in the days which are to come. We give you praise. We give you thanksgiving for all of it. In Jesus' name, amen.